Hi and welcome to uh, tonight's live stream. I'm Fred and you're watching Homo Dance, the channel on history and board games. Uh, and this timeline feels perfectly appropriate, appropriate as tonight's uh, show we have a guest that for me is the perfect embodiment of uh, being in between uh, history and board games, both in terms of design but also in terms of, uh, of um, uh, of approach when it comes to uh, to the to the kind of uh, work that he's been doing in the in the hobby. Um, tonight we have the pleasure to chat with Cole Werler, uh, the mind behind John Company, Pax Pamir, Root, and most lately Oath. Uh, and I'll structure this discussion in three major parts. Uh, the first part will focus on Cole's personal journey into gaming and game design. Um, the second will be the biggest part of our discussion. Uh, regarding his game design approach and relationship specifically to history as a material, but also as a topic in its game. Uh, and then we'll close with a, a lighter section uh, about having Cole's point of view around the state of the hobby and what's coming up um, in his uh, design work. As usual, if you're watching this live, uh, well, thanks uh, for being here, first of all. I really appreciate it. Uh, and remember that you can uh, react and ask your questions to, uh, to my guest uh, in the live chat. Uh, I try to bring them at the right time in the discussion. So if you're asking a question and you see that it's not being brought on screen necessarily straight away, it might be because I see that there is a better moment within the flow of the question that I've prepared where I think it would be a better moment uh, to, to bring it up. And if you're watching this after the stream, uh, we'll, have, we'll probably have added some time codes in the description uh, for you to navigate from one section to another uh, if you want to do that. Uh, so that's pretty much for my intro. Thanks for everyone for being here. And I'm going to welcome our guest, Cole. Hey, Cole, how are you? I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thanks for being with us um, tonight. Uh, I'm going to have a quick uh, look at the chat. And I can see that we already have quite a few people joining us. So that's really great. I can see some uh, of uh, the regulars uh, like Ross and Kirk, but I also see some new faces. So that's really nice. Hi, everyone. Hi, Wilmer. Hi, work. Hi, Marco. Oh, yeah, Marco is also a regular. So that's really, really cool. And we have Lord of the Board who's here, who I became a recent, a recent fan of the show. So that's really, really <laughs> nice. Um, and, uh, and Saverio, always, always there. So thanks, everyone, for joining us and uh, uh, for being with us uh, during that uh, chat with Cole. Um, I would like to start maybe a bit more uh, on, the, uh, on the personal uh, part of your journey. Um, and I didn't want necessarily to start by talking about Coverlet, the designer, but could you present us briefly Coverlet, the man outside of uh, game design? Outside of game design? Yes. Um, well, uh, let's see. What's, what are the defining things about me? Uh, I grew up in the Midwest, in the American Midwest, in a part of the country that gets called the Rust Belt, which kind of stretches sort of through the middle of the country. Um, I grew up in northern Indiana in kind of a post-industrial town. And uh, boy, it's hard to separate the, the design from, from the biographical. I grew up just playing games. I'm the oldest of a big family. We also always had, everyone always had friends hanging around our houses and we, you know, there are almost children spilling out the windows. Uh, and we were always kind of at play in that group. Um, and I also found myself, um, I think like a lot of other Midwestern kids, I felt like a little penned in. So I spent lots of time at the library and dreaming about how I was going to escape from, <laughs> from the American Midwest. Um, and I, you know, I, I think growing up, we, I also I, I loved uh, watching movies, reading books, just sort of consuming anything I could, learning as much as I could about the world around me. Um, I was convinced when I finished high school that I wanted to become a journalist, that I was quite, quite sure that that was what I wanted to do. Uh, it was a profoundly bad time to get into journalism, though. Uh, but that didn't bother me. I, I went to, to J school anyway. Uh, I went to Indiana University in, in southern Indiana and graduated uh, right as the Great Recession just turned the American economy uh, on its head. And I had I had the good fortune or the bad fortune to graduate um, at a period right before social media news people started to exist. There weren't mm. social media editors at that time. Uh, but right after Craigslist had removed all the ad revenue <laughs> from from the, the newspaper. So there just wasn't an entry level journalism job. Uh, that really existed when I graduated. So, uh, you know, after I finished my, my degree, I, I went and 
Uh, I worked with people with disabilities for uh, a couple years and then eventually found my way into graduate school, thinking that surely if a newspaper is falling apart, the university would last longer. And that proved to be a pretty silly thought as well, uh, because there weren't very many jobs by the time I was done with graduate school. But, uh, you know, the, the thing that is the through line through all of this, and I'm happy to talk more about any of those, mm. any of those things, is I just always found myself wanting to... Um, I don't know, learn more, do more, engage more deeply with the, with the, the people I was running into. Um, and I, w- I felt very blessed, very lucky um, to be able to have all that schooling and be able to constantly run into interesting kinds of stories and problems. Uh, and that curiosity kind of sustained me all the way through, uh, through graduate school. It's interesting that you're saying that originally you dreamt about uh, uh, being a journalist. Uh, th- there is a game designer, uh, Brian Train, that made that parallel, saying uh, that uh, game design can be a form of gener- journalism, a different way to depict events, have a point of view, and, and share with the wide audience uh, something that can be a complex situation. Do you see any parallel with some of the work that you've done and maybe journalism? You know, one of the f- uh, I learned so much in um, in journalism school uh, about how to about how to ask questions, but also how to make things. Um, one, one thing that I, I I remember we had to take these writing drills, and uh, the way the writing drills worked is you would go to class and they would put on a speech or something, and you had to pretend as if you were a reporter sitting in the room. And then after the speech was over, maybe it was a 20 minute political speech, they would say, all right, well, you have 45 minutes to write a uh, 800 word article about that speech. Mm. And we, I, I remember raising my hand and saying, oh, is this due tomorrow or is it due tonight? He said, no, 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 it's due by the end of class. You have to give me whatever, whatever you have done. And uh, it, was, it was horrifying, but you got better at it. And I, I always loved working on journalism projects because you couldn't procrastinate if you hadn't scheduled your interviews on time and you couldn't just invent those interviews. I guess you could be, you'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, and it taught me a different way of engaging with projects uh, that was um, much more thoughtful, not thoughtful, deliberate. You, you had to, you had to plan and you had to, when you were thinking about undertaking a big project, you had to become very familiar with the sort of work, the sort of bricks and mortar that you would use to accomplish that plan. And then when it came to accomplishing the plan, uh, one thing that I loved about, uh, about working, and I worked a little bit for a radio station called WFHB, just on kind of an internship, which was a community news radio station and for, for some other places. And one thing I loved about it is um, you are continuing to run into your own ignorance. You know, no person can understand their own ignorance. That's part of what makes it ignorance. But I feel like the folks I know who were real good reporters had a better understanding of their own ignorance. And they knew when they were out of their depth and they knew when to when to call someone who knew more. And I loved that humility of discipline. Mm. Um, and I found it really, really, really uh, uh, attractive. And it was, it was, um, you know, when I think about all of the, the journalists who were real he- heroes of mine at that time, and I'm thinking about people, um, both r- r- reporters like George Seldes, but also um, commentators like Bill Moyers, who just had a real intellectual humility and a real desire to find the, the best person they could possibly be talking to and see what they had to say about some important issue. Yeah, that's really interesting. Do you, do you f- feel that way, maybe in the way you approach research when you are doing game design, like starting from uh, maybe a topic that you don't know much about, and you uh, and you like to to like trying to find the the best kind of sources, like having that effort as a journalist trying to figure out what would be uh, something that is particularly relevant. Is it some a pleasure that you get from it? Well, you know, there I've I've never found any commonality in how everyone d- designs games. Even as I've started to sit in this industry longer, I, I have no one has written a, a book of best practices on design. Everyone does it quite differently. But I do find that designers fall broadly into two camps. Um, there are designers who, when they start a project, like to um, put themselves in almost sensory deprivation. They want to think about their own memory, their own intuitions, their own thoughts about a subject, and then try to find the truest enunciation of that subject. Um, and, and that can work pretty well for some designers, but I am in the exact opposite camp. If I'm starting a project, I want to play every game that has ever been made on that subject. Uh, and I want to find every book that I can find that seems relevant. And if not read the book, I want to at least scan through it and see what, what the high points are. 
Um, and I take that approach, um, whether or not I'm working on a big history game or a science fiction game, I want to take in the widest group of sources. Um, and I, and I think that has to do with the fact that I think of design principally as a conversation and it's a conversation where the utterances are the games that are made and the books that are written. And so if I want to be a good actor in that conversation, I do my best to listen before I, before I open up my mouth because Lord knows I won't shut it after I open it. Good. That's a warning for me uh, for the rest of the interview, <laughs> making sure that I keep you on track. Um, and I realized that I'm not respecting the structure of my own interview. So I'm going to go back. Oh, yeah. To sorry. We don't need to talk about design. No, no, but that's, not, that's me. That's on me. I asked the question uh, and I knew it wasn't the plan. So I'm going to go back to going back to, uh, to Cole and uh, your journey into, uh, into, into gaming and then game design. Um, so I've heard already in the first answer when you were talking about where you came from and your background, it felt like gaming was um, since childhood a big part of, um, of of your life. When did you felt that gaming could be something serious that you were really passionate about and not just something that you did uh, with friends to, um, mm -hmm. to to do something on a rainy afternoon? Where did you when did you start feeling passionate about it? Well, I, so, so gaming, I'll just underline how important it was to me growing up. My, my father taught all of our, us, myself and my, my siblings all how to play chess when we were very young and growing up, we played lots of games, um, mm. both classic games like risk and clue, uh, but also kind of weird games, whatever I could find. I grew up in an era where, um, a lot of my access to new media was through garage sales, yard sales. And so I remember finding a copy of Hero Quest at a garage sale and uh, my, my uncle giving me his, um, his old Avalon Hill games from the 60s, Chancellorsville and Tactics 2. And then I remember trading some of those for a copy of Squad Leader from another friend's uncle or, or father or something that they had a copy knocking around. And so I was really interested in games and they excited me and I spent a lot of time playing them. I was very lucky to have many friends that lived in the neighborhoods where I lived. And so after school, it was very common to bike to a friend's house to play a game of Risk or, or Stratego or Warhammer. Or later, we played Battlecry. Um, and we were always toying with the rules of those games. And I remember, you know, I made a, when we were playing a lot of Risk, I made a set of Risk rules that had vassal states where you could partially conquer a player and there was a little diplomatic intrigue system in it. And when I started getting into Twilight Imperium, actually I remember Twilight Imperium third edition was like a, a flashpoint in my, in my secondary education. It came out right at the end of high school for me. And I remember being so excited by it because we had played so much of the second edition of Twilight Imperium. And when the third edition came out, we, as a group, I mean, we, we went to, the local copy shop, I think it was called like fast print or something. And we printed out the rules and put them in these big plastic binders because we all wanted to study the rules so mm -hmm. that when Twilight Imperium finally arrived, we could play it that night. And we all hated it. <laughs> we hated it so much because it wasn't Twilight Imperium second edition. It was the third edition. And I remember um, within a week or two going home and writing notes for an old progression chart and trying to figure out a way to make a variant that would allow us to play a kind of combination game of Twilight Imperium 2 and 3. And so I was always tinkering with variants and thinking about that stuff. And then in when I was in college, I had the good fortune to play with a group of people that had done some, some playtesting for Fantasy Flight games. And they kind of took me closer to the bleeding edge of, of game design. I remember we, we would test games like Descent, uh, I think the Road to Legend campaign, or maybe the expansion before that. Um, and and I, I that kind of started showing me like the nuts and bolts of how games worked. And I should say, by the way, I I like Twilight Imperium three, and I love Twilight Imperium four. So just just so we're clear, that was actually uh, a follow up question just to ask. Yeah, but oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll answer that. And I I um, uh, Matt and Hunter at Space Cats Peace Turtles will know that if they get me talking about Twilight Imperium, that is the rest of the interview because I do mm. deeply love that design. Um, but the you know, something that, that happened in college is I really wanted to make a serious go at this whole journalism thing. And so I remember when my grandfather gave me a little money and said, go buy a laptop for college. I on purpose bought a bad laptop so I couldn't play games on it because I wanted, I just wanted a word processor. I wanted to focus on my discipline, my chosen discipline. And so when I was in college, I did a lot of community organizing, a lot of work in journalism, and tons and tons of, of re research for the English history department, departments, different professors at different times. And I really wanted to make a go of it. So I, gaming was very much sidelined. 
Now, I still had a copy of El Grande in my dorm, and we would still get together and play games, but I never thought about it seriously as a discipline. And that changed when I got to graduate school, and I, uh, I lived in an apartment on, in the, the uh, North Loop neighborhood of Austin, which is around 50th Street. And right across the street from my apartment was a game store called Great Hall Games. And this was the type of game store that is a little bit of a rare game store these days, but it's, the game, it's a game store that had been around for probably 30 or 40 years. Mm. And they had the most amazing selection of games. They had old Euros I'd never heard about. They had, uh, you know, like beautiful chess sets. They had, of course, all the more modern games that had been coming out. They had strange war games from smaller publishers. And I walked in and they had a game on the shelf in the new release shelf that had just come out called High Frontier. And so this was around 2010. And it, it had just come out and they had it on the shelf. And I looked in the back room. I saw a bunch of people were playing High Frontier. And I thought, well, this is so strange. So I'll I picked up a copy of High Frontier. And then the next week, I remember going into the store and someone was playing uh, Lords of the Spanish Main. And I thought, what is this weird game with paper cards? How strange. Like, what is this doing at a game store? I didn't think games look like this anymore. But I sat down and played it, and it just blew my mind. I was so excited by it. And uh, over then, you know, the years that followed the release of uh, Pax Perfuriana, uh, I mean, I, I felt very much on the bleeding edge. Because in 2012, when Pax Perfuriana came out, I, I got a copy right away. And we played it so much. And those were the first games that I had ever played, which made me think that some of the questions in journalism or in my academic research that I was interested in, that maybe they had answers uh, that, could be, that could take the form of games. Yeah. And that, that thought had never entered my mind. And as soon as it squirreled its way in there, I just found myself thinking more in terms of games. And I had always done that a little bit. I'd always liked kind of making little models and designing games just, just for fun, but never had a thought of publication. And, but, but, but seeing, uh, seeing Phil's work kind of inspired me to see if I could turn some of my academic ideas, my, the arguments I wanted to make, and put them into the form of games. But, but that didn't happen until much later in my, in my career. What specifically in Pax Porfiriana like made you feel that way? What what part of the experience triggered that idea that you could actually convey uh, like a depiction of history of political system through gaming? What specifically in the system, or is it the aesthetics? What, what happened? Well, there are a lot of things. Uh, what the, the the aesthetic matters a lot because the Pax Perfuriana, especially if, if you've seen those cards, is a busy game. Every yes. card. Every card looks like a uh, collage, uh, and you've got the proper edition there. The first, yeah, one. yeah. I'm going to show it for for the audience so they so okay, they realize good. what, what um, it is. So this is a topo card. So this is actually the less busy kind of card because that's yes, pretty um, straightforward. And, but... you know, I think that there were several things about Perfiriana that animated me. One thing was I had played a lot of political games for a long time, and there were all of these things. So one of the things that happens when you play a lot of uh, uh, historical games is that they tend to be about wars or about kings mm. or merchants maybe. And what was amazing about Perfiriana, which is a game that has merchants and kings and uh, wars in it, all those things are in Pax Perfiriana, but they are only a small fraction. Perfiriana was the first game I played that when I looked at the card list, I thought, oh, this is a world. It, mm. I, I felt like any, any history, any chapter of a history book, if I were reading, um, Frank McLinn's book on um, the, the, the Mexican uh, Revolution, any, any page could turn into a card. And so there was something about the game system being so expressive that uh, just sort of empowered me. It made me feel that like, oh, I think that actually games are much more open than, than I had previously thought. That's interesting. So I think that makes the perfect transition toward the second part of the discussion, which is about your approach about game design and how you use history in that, uh, in that, in that. And you were saying something interesting about Pax Porfiriana is that, yes, it's about a conflict, but it's about so many more aspects of it. And in your own designs, you actually talk about um, uh, different kinds of actors that you don't necessarily see in wargaming. So it's not about only generals and kings and specific corporations, but you're actually talking uh, about actors on the lower level and the political, economical, uh, especially Pax Pamir, you're, like you're, you're not playing one of, one of those uh, people that you would normally see in history books. You see the people who are directly impacted and make day-to-day -day decision and as a whole or as a group actually have an influence on the outcome. 
And I'm wondering from a research point of view, uh, what kind of sources do you require to actually get those information to design games like Pax Premier, for example? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the types of sources you need vary really dramatically by the project. Um, so Premiere is, Premier is an interesting example of, um, of how like the long road of sourcing that goes into a, 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 that can go into a historical game. So uh, Phil had asked me, um, the, the designer of Pax Furiana had asked me um, if I'd be interested in doing a game that was closer to my own research. And so I thought, well, I do want to do a game about this period called The Great Game, which was a geopolitical contest between the British Empire and the Russian Empire for most of the 19th century. And one of the things that was so frustrating about that subject was that it sort of looks like Victorian James Bond, if you look at it the wrong way. But it's such an exciting way to look at it. That, that was how people end up looking at it. Mm. And so I thought like, well, I really want to do this subject. But the problem is if I do the subject, it's going to look like Victorian Twilight Struggle or Victorian James Bond, yeah. which is not how I want it to look. And so this gave me a very big problem, which was how do I do a game about a subject that no one knows very much about? And by no one, I mean mostly game players don't know much about. But then how do I do it in such a way that doesn't allow their expectations to dominate? how the game ends up looking. And so I just sort of thought about this. I just kind of had this idea in the back of my head. And uh, I ran, I saw an interesting talk while I was at the University of Texas doing my graduate work. And then I, I read that this book called um, Tribe and State by Christine Noel, which was just about Afghan state formation. And when I was reading the book, it just occurred to me that if that this was in fact great, a great subject for a game, but that the perspective had to be from the perspective of the kind of shards of the Durrani state, hmm. uh, which was the, the sort of like proto-Afghan state that extend, extended to um, the, the, edge, the edge of Persia and, of, and the Punjab. And uh, it, 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 it only lasted a uh, hundred years or so, and then it, it collapses. And then out of the, the political tumult of its collapse emerges the modern Afghan state. And I thought, okay, well, that's the story. The story is, you know, the, the story has to do with what does it mean to form a state on the edge of an empire? And so I read Christy Noel's work. I read a bunch of other academic works about just how states are built in this period, what it meant to start a state. Um, and uh, that started giving me a sense of the things that I would have to learn in order to make the, 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 this game. And uh, the, the reason I'm framing it that way is I had some academic training in this area but I was not, um, you know, I, I I don't read Farsi, and I I there there are a lot there, there, there yeah how come, right there are just there are many gaps that I that I couldn't fill in, and so I went on about a two year reading period where I just read and I I talked to people who know a lot more about these subjects than I did, and I listened as best I could, and gradually built a body of text, oftentimes um, primary histories of the subject. So history is written at that time and then started trying to figure out what were the thing, if you were organizing, if you were one of the, the, the fragments of this empire trying to organize some state in this area, what were the things that you were worried about? What were the, what were the kind of pressures that, that they were facing on, on, on the ground? And mm -hmm. then could I graft those pressures into the, into the historic state? And I think th th this gets into a question of design aesthetics, because in, in my view, a good history game, should put the players in the minds of specific actors or groups of actors and should give them the pressures that were felt at the time. And that often means allowing yourself to be a little ahistorical. And so I, I've started thinking about my history games as almost works of historic fiction because what I'm trying to do is capture a mood in a time that will tell us a lot about that time, but I'm not trying to tell the story of what happened. I'm trying to tell, I'm trying to allow players that maybe they'll tell that story. Maybe they'll tell a different story that will shed a light on a different part of the uh, of the conflict. And it's interesting that we're talking about historical fiction because I was reflecting upon the fact that you have Flashman as a character in Pax yep. Pamir, which is a character of historical fiction, and you could say was the Victorian James Bond, you know? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, he's there. I, I put little, I put little Easter eggs in all my games, and he, I wanted him to sit there because, uh, and as I say in the. Uh, historic notes for that card if he never you know he never existed but a type existed that he is based on and you know critically he is a weak card he is yeah. not 
very useful. He, he can be very useful, but he is not the star of the show. And so I put him there because for folks who who want him, who want to play him, who want to kind of inhabit, they want to be Eldred Pottinger or something, um, they can see that he was there. An, a, an actor like there, like an, an actor, a historical actor like that was in fact on the ground, mm. but they were in the margins. They were on the edge of the stage. They were not the major drama. And so the reason why I decided to, to put in that that card and a couple other cards like that is to allow players to see where actors like that would have sat in the larger drama. Yeah. Because if if they're not in there, then players are going to start making assumptions about who who the who they might be acting as. Mm. And I didn't want them to in their assumptions to overwrite the, the history of the game. Uh, yeah, that's that's a really great thought. Uh, I like that a lot. Like still having those elements, but putting them in the context of the wider scale of things. And I think in a way, by contrast, it makes your argument even stronger about what you want to talk about, about what you think matters. Uh, and that transitioned me to, to the next question that I have is that do you think it is crucially important for a game designer that is designing about specifically a historical topic to have strong arguments and a thesis getting into the game and not just trying to um, uh, regurgitate uh, research, but actually have a specific point of view that they want to transmit. Do you think this is key in in good game design or in interesting game design at least? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you, I want I want them to have something that they're trying to say for sure, but it doesn't have to just be a, a message. I've actually I've run to this very uncomfortable realization. This is probably the first time I'm saying it on tape, but it's an uncomfortable realization all the same. That um, there there is a spectrum in game design. And on one side of that spectrum, there is uh, the game with message, right? Like you, if you play this game, you will understand 100% what my message is. You will you understand who the bad guys are and who the good guys are, and there'll, there'll be no other uh, points of confusion. Uh, but on the other side, there is the game that is expressive. Mm. And the more expressive the game is, the more it will be capacious enough to house different kinds of messages, but often these things are a trade-off. The more broad you make your game, the more likely it is for someone to misinterpret it. And uh, so I've, I've, I, I often think about games as having arguments, but I mean that uh, in a very narrow academic sense, which is to say the game is present, can, can present many arguments, some of which I'm very aware of, and some of which I don't even understand in the sense that a game is always going to reflect the cultural context of its creation. Yeah. And it will, it will speak in more voices than, it, than, than I have. Um, but the, the thing that I want, and I think this is the more direct answer to your question is the thing I want in a design from my own designs and from the designs of others is to feel as if something urgent is being communicated to me. And it doesn't have to be an answer. It could just be questions. But I want there to be a reason why the game is existing and for the game to have something to say. Uh, and I think when I play games that don't have that sense of urgency, those are the ones that tend to leave me flat, that don't get me like reading the rules at night and thinking about playing it the next mm. time. Because I feel like, well, it's kind of, I, I, you know, I know what it said or it didn't, it didn't have much, much to say at all. Uh, and I think that is more true for certain kinds of design than for others. I don't uh, apply this text to the quack, this test to the quacks of Queldenburg. Um, <laughs> And I like the quacks of Queldenburg just yeah. fine, um, but I, I think it's just a very different. It's just a very different kind kind of uh, kind of object that's being made. Yeah, it's a different kind of experience. And you were saying that depending on how expressive the game design is, you're opening yourself to having more uh, diverse set of interpretation of your game. Do you think that a designer can also miss his own point in his oh, game yes. design and having oh, yes. his game saying something radically different than, than what he has in mind, like the arguments that he has in mind? Yeah, I mean, I well, and, and I think uh, Phil Eklund is a, and, that, and that's it, that's the elephant in the room. I'm going yeah, yeah. there. I'm going well, there. Yeah, well, but I think it's a great example because I think yes. his games are so much more uh, subtle and expressive than his overt argumentation, uh, which is oftentimes not great uh, and sometimes awful. Um, but but it's a big m mixed bag. It's hard to. Um, I think it's difficult to sum up anyone's whole body of work in like a single a single line or something. But I do think you know with Phil's work that that that's highlighted. And there, you know, I think um, in my own, I am sure that in my own work there are other ways of reading that I don't even understand. And and that that's fine. That's just part of what it means to communicate anything. 
And that's really interesting. So just to touch upon um, Fide Clun's uh, work, I think it's interesting because um, originally I didn't know much about him. And the first time I played his game, I was really interested because I thought it was a really, pretty good, like a good representation or an interesting one about materialist approach to history. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that's not what was his point. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I probably misinterpreted him strongly. And then I read his uh, designer notes on, I don't remember which game it was, and I was completely appalled by them, like how yeah. some sometimes misinformed they could be, uh, sometimes borderline racist. Uh, and I was like really shocked by by the experience that I had in gaming and, and actually the point of view of the designer. And I was, is it me not seeing something or is it possible that the designer himself is missing his own point? And I was a bit, uh, and had this tension around loving a design and feeling extremely uncomfortable about the designer. Mm -hmm. so, well, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Well, I mean, I, I think that this is a very, there's a very reasonable re 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 response. You know, uh, I, 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 may, I help moderate with my brother a little Discord uh, for, for really good games, and for we handle some of our testing there. And it's also a place where people d discuss games. And what we found um, was that whenever people brought up the games of Phil Eklund, uh, an argument would break out. And just people would be throwing throwing tomatoes at each other. And this was these were the most kind and just grounded mm. people. I'd been talking to folks on this Discord for a long time, but there was something about Phil that made people uh, go crazy. And I think there is a desire to, to take him to task for, for his beliefs, which is a good one. I, I don't, you know, I think uh, whenever someone asks me to, to, to comment on Phil and I say, well, he, he's often wrong and he was, he's probably very wrong in this particular case. And uh, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I have no interest in shielding him. I, I think if people mm. have good criticisms and many people do, they, they should take them to Phil and they should make their criticisms known. That's, that's excellent. Um, but one of the things that I that I realized that was happening is I think that there's a desire in our own media consumption, because uh, and this is I think because the game industry is a very um, I don't know if chummy is the right word, but but it's a small world. It's a world where you know you and I can talk. We we both have published yeah. games, and and we can talk to other folks, and and people want to to sort of like and look up to the people who are publishing games. And so if someone has a bad character, you don't want to financially support them. And that's a very reasonable, uh, that's a reasonable course of action. But um, it's also reasonable to not have those thoughts. And I, I usually think about this from the perspective of just from an academic, uh, from my, my own academic training. Um, people who are quite broken and quite wrong generate very beautiful and very interesting things sometimes. And people who are beautiful and perfect in other ways can generate very insipid and boring things. <laughs> and that, and every, and every work is sort of filled with angels and demons. It can't help but be because it tells you a lot about the circumstances of its creation. And so when I play Phil's games, I see, you know, the kid of a rocket scientist who grew up in the American Southwest in a very libertarian place, who was often probably pretty sharp and maybe got, drank too much of his own medicine hmm. and i don't really know though i mean i see a lot and i and i've i've met phil i i, I don't know him well but i i mean I've, I've met him i've had i've shared a meal with him and i feel like i his games are filled with contradictions yeah in the way that anyone's work is filled with contradictions but there are some artists there are some folks where the contradictions are sharper and so what we ended up doing at the whirly gig discord is i ended up having to kind of break in and say look um there are many very good reasons to not play a game by a designer for whatever reason. I don't, I mean, there's, there are lots of, there are lots of reasons why you might not want to buy a game that someone's made or play a game. Uh, there are also many reasons why you might want to. And so when we're talking about games, it's important to allow grace to both sides of that, because look, uh, Pax Perfuriana is filled with um, fringe libertarian ramblings in those footnotes but uh, it, it is a direct inspiration for my work on Premiere, which has yeah. completely different politics. And I, I found in it a, something really animating and exciting. And I don't want to be unfair to my own lived experience 
and say and like write it out of my life because that, that's not fair to, to yeah. what the, the design could do. Um, and so I, I've, I've kind of ended up trying to say like, you know, there, I just want, when it comes to the, the consumption of art, um, what an artist is intending, I just don't think matters. It doesn't, it isn't the, the, the central thing because meaning instead is negotiated. I mean, this is such a funny thing. It was so, it's so funny to be talking about this because I just had this conversation with, with someone last night, you know, in my own academic training, um, the notion that uh, an artist's intent matters is laughable. It's like saying uh, to a physicist that gravity doesn't exist yeah. because there's a general assumption uh, in something called the intentional fallacy, that the intention doesn't matter. Meaning instead is oftentimes something that's negotiated between us, the readers over here and the text over here and the intersection of those things. That's where meaning gets generated. And so I don't really care what Phil thinks because his games speak and they speak in all kinds of voices and I think they are intriguing. Um, but I also think that if you find Phil's politics abhorrent and you can't play them and separate out the artist from the work, that's fine. I don't for I don't want to force anybody to play anything. I, there are games about subjects that I find too close um, that I think stop me from being a good player or a good designer. There are subjects that simply can't can't be can't be done yet and that that is very that's a very reasonable thing you know it's, it's i think that a little bit of ac of scholarly distance is a very good thing and there are subjects that i don't write about because they are too close to a lived experience and i too sensitive and so whenever someone tells me like oh you know i don't want to in the context of the global war on terror i don't want to play pax premier and i say well know that premier takes place about 200 years before the global mm. war on terror but also I understand. That's a totally reasonable reason not not to play the game. Um, and I don't, you know, I, I think that um, I want to. We have to always make sure to be sensitive to um, the feelings of the people who are playing these games. So I have a lot of sure, 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 potential sure. direction going next to that because that's that's uh, that's that opens up a very really fascinating discussion. Maybe going back to what you were saying about flawed individuals sometimes produce beautiful things, and, and I, I completely agree with that. And for me, that goes in the direction of really putting game design as an art. Um, and and would you really put it, it completely in that category, or do you think it is uh, a bit more uh, complex than that? And it's between art, but also like just creating a product because. There is also the reality of the production of of of, of game design. They are made to be consumed, so uh, and 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 they have to be manufactured and everything. So I would like really to to pick your brain on what do you think game design is? Is it pure art or is it something else? And and what's your position on this? When I used to teach my undergrads uh, about aesthetics and criticism, I would tell them that art was a word that you used to defend the things that you thought were valuable and devalue the things that you didn't mm. care about it is uh it, it's a term of capital cultural capital manipulation so i say that this particular artist is producing brilliant art but that the beatles are garbage and that is doesn't count as art and what i'm doing is saying that the, the works that i value are of higher call of higher capital than the, the works of someone else so i always see the word art de deployed in very careful strategic ways around around that so i think of course games are art and then the question becomes well what kind of art are they and this is the hard question um th this is the, the question that will keep you up at night because obviously a game is not a song it's not a movie yeah. um i think about them as being quite fragile really i mean a, a song could be whistled it could be remembered you know you can go to a playground and find kids clapping along and playing uh nursery songs or play schoolyard songs that have been perpetuated for decades because they're so memorable that they don't need to be taught them because they're going to be taught them through the through the play through the playground and certain games can be like that too when i was teaching a um teaching uh, at a summer camp um, where I met my wife, actually. We were directing the summer camp in Bloomington, Indiana. And uh, I invented this game called Spider Tag, which the kids, when I went back a couple years later, were still playing. Now, the game was a little different, but they were playing a version of that same tag. Um, and 
it, it, it reminded me of the degree to which games can be carried through their, their meme ability, their ability to kind of like grow and change. So it, it's a kind of art that can be memed, but boy, uh, that's never going to happen to John company. I think about historical games as being incredibly fragile. I mean, they, they there's no way they're going to last as long as a poem. Uh, just because there are so many materials that need to be held. It's also worth noting that games require players. Uh, so this makes them not like a movie, but more like a play in that they're requiring something of the actors. But it's different from a play because the actors are also an audience. Mm. Um, and this kind of leads me to thinking that if we are going to think about games as art, which I think we should, this kind of art they are are this is a weird improvisational form that requires the participants of the game to also be the audience and that is a i think that's a very fascinating way of, of thinking what what a game is but it, it all but it underlines how strange it is because i think it's one thing to say oh yeah of course games are art but they are art in a way that is different from a memoir that is different from a book of poetry that is even different from a play so in a way, you would say that game design is a template for an interactive form of art. So you're providing the, the framework for that. So do you think that as a game designer, you're making people artists because as they play the game, they actually they become performers like, uh, like uh, someone who sings or someone who actually plays a play? Do you think that there is this... Actually, it's even more collaborative in that way because you yeah. have a straight collaboration between the game designer and, and, and the player. And their interaction, abstracted or that can be distanced by miles, by by years, and everything, that interaction is is actually generating the art itself. And and I, I think that's true, and there can be no doubt of it. And if you need any proof, you can just look at the rise of um, the groups who stream their plays of Dungeons and Dragons, mm. places like Critical yeah, Role that's and, and the other ones, where you see the line between player and actor being really porous. Um, and, but but I also think that the I, I, I recognize, too, that um, what an actor does in a play is very different from what a player might do, even if that player is emoting and really getting into the into the mood, um, because and this is one of the trickiest things about games. If every participant in a game, every player is also is both an actor and also the audience, then every single game is generating as many different stories as many different memories as there are people playing the game so this means that the games are generating these very like i think it's just a very fragmented uh very fragile type of uh, of, of artistic creation um and so i always want to be very careful when i talk about games because i i i think about them very seriously and i think that they're a good and urgent and useful form for engaging with the world but i also think what they give players is so evanescent it's so fragile and i think here about um so I, i've mentioned this other places but i i adore um the game apex legends i love it i think it's brilliant i think it's one of the best first person shooter games that's ever been designed and there are moments in apex legends which are transcendent in, in a in a in a way like a sports like a memory, if you've ever played a played a sport seriously, and you had just the way the puck got past you at the last moment, and th this earlier thing that happened was now in reverse, and there was this amazing just swell and shot, and you made it, and the game was over. And what happened, even if it was captured on video, was not really captured on video. So that the actual like excitement, the actual moment of transcendent, is gone. It is like only there, like at that instant. Uh, and, and I think on the one hand, that's a bummer <laughs> um, because it because I, I would want such a thing to be crystallized and framed on a wall. But it also is one of the most beautiful things about games that they can have those those kinds of moments. And what do you think make historical games specifically more fragile than other games? Oh, I think they make much more steep, much steeper demands on their players. Um, you have you just have to learn more. You have to read a bigger rule book. Um, and you have to take in more context. I mean, uh, when I was when I was recently learning your game, I started with the uh, historical notes, which were excellent. And I think it was days before I sat down and read the rules to the game because I just and I, and I, I had I had read I've read a couple books on the commune. It's not totally a new thing for me, but I really wanted to situate my, my, myself um, in 
in that world. And I, I think about this a lot with John Company, which I think is mm-hmm. probably the best piece. The second issue of John Company, I think, is probably the best piece of design I've ever done. But it is also the hardest game to learn. I mean, it is really a whole world. It, it demands so much. And in fact, I wrote, I have this thing at my desk, so I'll flash it before the camera. I wrote this little note, which uh, we are putting in the, every copy of John Company, which is framed as a letter and then a teaching guide and also how to store the game. But the note basically says, uh, this game take a, took a long time to make, and you're going to want to take a long time to learn it. Like, make a cup of coffee settle in like this is a big project that you're undertaking as a player and the reason i felt like i wanted to write that note was because i feel like there just needed to be some introduction because otherwise someone's going to look at the rule book which is pretty long it has Mm -hmm. lots of pictures in it but it's still long and they're going to look at the rule book and say like oh lord i can't i can't do that and the rule book is written in a pretty conversational, pretty slow style. And it isn't a hard rule book to learn, especially compared to a lot of other uh, historical games of similar weight. But one thing that I thought might help players is if they realized that they were getting ready to start a long novel. So they shouldn't go in thinking it was going to be a short story. Yeah. And if I just kind of gauged their impressions correctly, it would make it just easier for them to move through it. And all of that complexity, it's doing something. Um, the, the kind of story that John Company is attempting to tell is a big, big, big story. And you kind of do need to spend a while to think about, well, how does Parliament connect to a socialite marriage, connect to trade in South India, connect to a revolt in the Punjab? And so if you want to, if you want to, cable all of those things together if you want to try to connect those events uh that connective tissue has to be pretty ro- robust and so i think a lot of the historical games that have really big scopes they just make really really steep demands on the, the players which makes them even more fragile that happens okay so now i'm going i'm um, completely putting aside my flow of questions and now i'm going into a different direction why do you design games? Is there, do you want to convey specific ideas? You were talking about the fact that you were a community organizer. You talked about your approach to game design. You talked about your academic background. Do you think that game design can also be a sort of a way to research, communicate, but also a form of political activity that you can communicate opinions uh, about specific events, about uh, the way the world works? Do you see it that way? When I was finishing my dissertation, I asked my mentor, uh, Sam Baker, if I could delay my defense five months. And he said, well, you can, but why would you want to do that? Everything's ready. And I said, well, I I can't defend now because I have to finish the rule book for John Company First Edition. And I had never at that point told him that I had been designing games during my graduate education. And uh, he was very confused at first. And I said, there are so many more people are going to read this rule book than will ever read my dissertation. Mm. And I, I am speaking, I think games have urgency for two reasons. One, because there is an audience that wants to consume tricky ideas. And I want to give them tricky ideas to consume. And, and that just the existence of the audience alone can demand the, the form. And the second reason is that some of the ideas that I want to try to get across are really well suited to the game form and are not well suited to academic articles. Mm. So I could write some of my arguments down about Pamir, but they wouldn't do justice to the fluidity of the situation the way a game might. And so, you know, one thing that I always think about when I'm working on a title is I ask myself the question, does this even make sense as a game? Like, is this a play? And if it's a play, then surely I'm not the right person to write it. I've never written a play before. Uh, and and I, I always try to ask myself, that, especially when it comes to, to video games, for instance, because I, I love video games and um, I thought about building them, but I've never made one. And if I'm working on a game idea that would be better suited as a, as a video game, then I will find somebody I know who works in video games and say, hey, do you want a weird idea? Or I will just throw it away because I have to lean into my own skill set. But oftentimes uh, I, I always think about games as having a kind of urgency and it's an urgency for a specific kind of idea to be communicated in that form. Uh, And so usually the things that I'm working on as games, they could only ever be games. That's what they are. But so in that sense, do you think that there is a risk of making games that are that fragile? Because if you think about, for example, community organizing or or political activism, you you need to have um, different levels of materials and 
it, it actually it's actually extremely hard to convey ideas and you know that if you st start straight with very complex ways to interact with your ideas you're actually going to reach a narrower audience and and like you have that whole tension around how do I communicate those ideas that I have? And what's the trade-off between the level of complexity that I'm offering in, in terms of game design and the and the and the audience that I want to reach? How do you balance that? Because your games are pretty complex. Yeah, <laughs> so, they, are, yeah. they tend to be. Um, yeah, that you know, I, I think that they, they vary in complexity from moderately to complex to very complex. Um, you know, there are one is never alone in discourse. There's always so many people talking. And so I think about sometimes as my little niche as trying to get these ideas across in this particular way. And someone else might be working on a podcast that covers a similar subject and Godspeed to them because that we're all part of the, the same in, in endeavor. And in fact, sometimes when I'm thinking about my history games, I always think about them as uh, game. Hi, hi, I don't think this is quite as true as it used to be, but I used to think that um, most history games were like 20 or 30 years behind the current like edge of scholarship. Hmm. And so that most of my game career was just spent trying to make it so the games were only five or 10 years behind rather than being 30 years behind. I don't think that's quite true anymore, uh, but it was certainly true when I, when I started. Um, you know, when I think about the, politics of the games um i all of the games that i work on are political they can't help but be political that's not a choice by the way i'm i mean all games are political but my games are especially political and i i want to um push players to learn new things about these periods you know I, I, as I, I, john company is on my mind just because it was recently completed and i think no matter what your position is on the British Empire, and there's really only one real position, which is that it was a completely evil um, organization. Um, but even no matter how much you might know about the British Empire, you're going to probably come into John Company and find some things that upset some of your preconceived notions and find other things that might validate your ideas. You might feel challenged or put off, and, and that's great. And so I, I always, I'm always thinking about... Um, trying to build designs that challenge players with new and interesting angles on a subject that they might know really well. And then on, on that same note, uh, you know, one thing that, that I, I try to keep in mind when I'm working on projects is I try to be very aware of the discourse in which I'm participating. So Pax Famir is not just a game about Afghanistan. Hmm. It's a game about Afghanistan in a world where there are not very many games about Afghanistan. It's a game about... Uh, a society where oftentimes the people in that society, if they're in other games, are marginalized, they're used for set dressing. And so when I went into building Pax Premier, I thought, well, I absolutely do not want to do that. I want to make uh, the different Afghan political leaders and thinkers and just people who lived at this time, I want to put them at the center of the story. And I was putting them at the center of the story, both because it was the right thing to do, but also because it was the right thing to do for the discourse in which I existed. Um, and I think that, that when, I, when I'm thinking about the politics of my game, that is of my games generally, that is how I'm usually thinking about it. Like in the context of hobby games in the 21st century, I want my games to kind of answer um, the deficiencies I see in that discourse. And, and I'll, I'll let you get in in a second, but I'll, I'll add to that. John Company works like that too. Um, you know, I, right now, there is a feeling that imperialism as a subject is pretty gauche. It's pretty, uh, a pretty horrible subject for a game. And I don't disagree um, because a lot of games do it so badly. And when I was working on John Company, one of my, one of my goals, and I, I had thought about maybe not even doing it. I'm like, does the game, does the world really need another game about empire? Well, surely not. There's plenty. But what I realized as I was thinking about that is that even though there were plenty of games on empire, almost no games had anything to do with empire. They were, they were about empire the way Risk is about empire. They weren't mm -hmm. saying anything interesting. And so suddenly John Company started generating a sense of urgency about itself because, well, the, the, the East India Company was a very complicated institution and it behaved in very strange and, and, and revealing ways that could teach people a lot about the foundations of the British Empire if they took it on its own terms. And so instead of just running away from a difficult subject, I, I dove in all the more headfirst. It's really interesting what you're saying about thinking about the discourse that you're taking part of, because one of the things that made me love Pax Pamir was the point of view that you took 
uh, that you decided, well, I'm going to make a game about, uh, I'm going to make a design about the great game, but I'm not going to make it uh, Victorian Toilet Struggle, which is, would be the, the classical approach that you would expect from a game design. You take a different angle and you actually, for me, this game talks a lot more about imperialism than most of the games or if any game that I've played uh, uh, to. And that's the thing that I think is interesting. I think we need more games about imperialism because I think that even though we have a lot of games that have this as a topic, we don't really have a lot of games about imperialism. And that's yeah. my whole problem with the hobbies that we don't really talk about what it is, the system that it is, what kind of decision does it generate? Where does it see, what, where was its incentive and its um, uh, uh, philosophy? And, and this is never, almost never portrayed. It's always extremely abstracted and represented between conflict between imperialism, but it's not talking about imperialism itself. And I, I don't know, and I would be curious to hear about what, what your thoughts, but I feel like actually there are not that many games about imperialism actually about imperialism yeah so i i mean i think about no notable games for me include the game colonialism and uh i actually i really admire martin wallace's struggle of empires yeah which i i think is a little cartoonish in its approach but is one of the best games about 18th century geopolitics which is, is it's is itself uh you know riddled with, with, with imperialism now what one thing that that game does that that can be a little alarming and a little uncomfortable and it's worth noting before anybody plays it is uh many critical issues um of of empire are kind of pushed to the margins but that's because the game is from the perspective of the ruling parties who often pushed those issues to the margins um i think the same could be said about um Gupta and Matthews's uh, Twilight, uh, Imperial Struggle, which uh, creates a, a clear hierarchy in, in the kinds of thinking. Like it really does put you into the center of, of the the 18th century, you know, ruler's mind, uh, and that can be that can be a good and and a bad thing. Uh, another game about, um, and, and this is more about post colonialism than it is about colonialism, but I really admire uh, Angola. I think it's a it's it's a mm. amazing design, truly amazing. Um, one of the best games about civil war and insurgency uh, that's ever been made, and um, and and I and I w wish there were more games like it, more games that really wanted to, to 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 tell those stories. You know, one of the things I really wanted to do with John Company was talk about uh, how Empire. I mean, really, the, the, the game is an attempt at an origin story movie for Empire because empires don't just pop out of nowhere. A little, a little, you know, a, a little kingdom that that has a, just a handful of cities in it is not a small empire. It's a little kingdom with a handful of cities. Empires, there are specific things that that cause them to incubate and grow, and so, and and one of those things could be these big, these big uh, transnational, royally sanctioned monopolies of the 18th century and and before, and so, you know, at the start of of john company the british empire does not exist in any meaningful way at least not in the way that it would come to yes. exist later and it's also not it's also quite possible that it will not come to existence in, in that way um and yeah and i think th th this is a place where, where the game can kind of dismantle some of our preconceptions about what uh what the british did in india and why they might have done it and talking about I second Josh's yeah. comment there about yeah. the real struggle. Yeah, and, and there are a lot of extremely good discussion in the chat, so I'm trying to bring them up here. It's hard to follow the two, but uh, Josh is saying some really interesting things. Uh, Joe is also having a really interesting points, and uh, Johan earlier was, was saying really interesting things about gaming philosophy. So there is a lot of good stuff also happening in the chat. Just something to, to bring, not necessarily lighter, but just to maybe to, to close mm -hmm. a bit that discussion. Uh, I wanted to also have your point of view. You were talking about how your game take part in the discourse. And and we talked a bit uh, on Twitter before before you came here about the Russian uh, localization of your sure. game. Uh, and there were a few things that um, uh, someone on Discord pointed out to me and shared some pictures, and I'm going to bring them up. And there were two two specific things, and that's the first one on the on the side of the box under Pax Pamir, the blurb actually removes the mention of empire or anything reminding about imperialism. And the second part, like saying that the the views of the designers doesn't represent the views of the of the publisher and everything. So there are, of course, I don't speak Russian, but I trust yes. the person that actually shared with me those those uh, those pictures. I wanted to get your reaction about yeah. how do you feel about that localization? How do you feel about maybe do you feel um, 
a bit disempowered about the fact that you had so much thought in the way you designed the games and seeing them a bit uh it's it's very minor changes but still it is it is going directly against what you were trying to yes. say yeah well you know one of the things about localization that is so challenging is that i do not speak all those languages i have no way of, of checking or knowing um but you so when, when you're choosing a localization partner you you find one with with a good pedigree where there are people that, that you trust and you give them the text but ultimately they have to do the job of reading their own political context and making decisions of translation. And um, I think uh, this is not a controversial statement, but every work of translation is a, is a work of authorship in itself and changes the text. That's just what the translation means. Um, I don't expect that anything I write that is translated is going to be perfectly translated. Um, and, I, and I expect that, it, that the translator will always leave their imprint. That's just part of what it, what it means. And so, um, you know, when I look at that, to me, that says a lot more about Putin's Russia than it says about the people at Crowd Games. It says a lot more about the water that they swim in than the thing that we're putting in the water. Um, and I like to believe that the, that the game is strong enough to survive and subvert even those those little translations. And there are others too. I, again, I was only made aware of this maybe a few months ago, mm -hmm. but uh, there are other little 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 choices in the uh, in in the language of of some of the, the 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 flavor text of the cards, especially the cards relating to Russia, where just little adjustments were made to maybe make someone seem a little bit more uh, valorous than they were. And yeah. I. Um, I, I think as, as someone, as a scholar, not that I ever want to call myself that really, but if I can remove myself from the circumstance, if I can you know, give myself 20 years and look back, well, I find that very interesting. I think that's very compelling. I'm sort of delighted by it in the way that, that, if, that if I were a translator who discovered that, I'd be delighted to find that little shift because it does show that the text is adapting to its own time. You know, there was um, a bootleg Chinese copy of Root that made a lot of very wild choices about the look of the game. And they read it all the art. They stripped all the names off. It's highly illegal what, what they did. But at the same time, I will admit to being completely delighted by it. Because when I see it, I see that the Woodland Alliance on the cover is in the top left. They, they look so powerful and strong. And I thought, oh, well, this is a game that you would see in the context of a Maoist China, right? I mean, this, this makes sense that they're going to find the insurgent faction and elevate them, and they're going to make the cat look even much more evil. Whereas in our own aesthetic design of the game, Kyle was very careful about not overly vilifying any character. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I think that when it comes to translations, I, I really do trust my partners to make decisions, even editorial decisions, that are going to be right for whatever their audience is. But I also know that that, but on the other hand, uh, um, or rather, let me phrase that differently. So I trust them to make th those decisions, but I hope that they also know, so I trust them to know, that those decisions that they make are going to reflect on them and the context in which they exist in a way that I can't control for. Um, so because I, thankfully I don't have to deal with, with that. And I, I love that history about Root uh, because it, it, it makes me think about something and going back to the concept of uh, game design as, uh, as an art. So at, at least in French, in France, we had situationism. So the, the, the movement by philosophical and artistic movement by Guy Debord, and they did a lot of détournement and, and something like this stayed in our popular culture where you have a lot of people doing uh, détournements or changes of films. So you have this idea that uh, of people that are changing the dubbing of American films and making them say completely different stories. Sure. Uh, so some some of them actually have really strong Marxist doctrine being <laughs> conveyed in yes. Western and stuff like this. So it's pretty fun. And they and they were also in the cartoon in the comic book industry. You had a lot of ideas of détournement, and there was uh, I think it was like uh, ten or fifteen years ago um, uh, uh, a Belgian um, comic book artist that took mouse and uh, redid the whole book and everyone was a mice in it uh, and there were no uh, and no more animals different animals in it and just to and it made the actually the comic even more violent uh, yeah in, in a way and there were sometimes lighter things um, where you just uh, where you have child comic books where just characters disappear and you just have a lonely character talking to himself and it says a lot of things about depression and there was a lot of ideas and do you think that maybe as an as an industry maybe um, 
uh, board gaming is a bit too, um, I don't know, com commercial and maybe less artistic. And we should do more of those weird things, like taking a design, change it, and shape it. Not, not as a ripoff, but actually as a as a as an actual artistical homage uh, of. Well, the, the board game industry is, uh, to me, it's a weird. It's at the weird confluence between um, the publishing industry generally, let's say books, and uh, the toy industry. And that is um, that can be an uncomfortable parentage to shake yeah. off sometimes. And this is one reason why when I do the Whirligig games, we always put our games into the Creative Commons. Bec and and it's they're under a non-commercial license. So anybody who wants to remix the design, if you want to make, I mean, uh, you know, somebody after they, uh, after Premiere came out, someone made a PAX Expanse where they, they loved the Expanse science fiction setting so much that they made a completely full conversion of the of PAX Premier to the, the world of the Expanse. And they asked me for permission. They, they sent me this, this lovely message and uh, asked me if, if, they, if, if I, I could give them my blessing. And I said, you don't need my blessing. The game is in the Creative Commons. You, you just do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, of course, I mean, I, I thought it was great. And I don't, I don't know the Expanse well, I'm, but it, I, was, I was glad to see it. And I hope something like that happens to John Company. I, I, you know, I, I like to see these projects um, grow and twist in all kinds of ways. And I think that um, what we're doing is so much more than just making playthings. Yeah. Um, and so to, to, for them to have kind of second, third, all these afterlives, that's just an important part of, of, of what it means to, you know, exist in a culture, right? Um, I think so, uh, too often, especially in this industry, we can get very precious about the things that we make. And I, I mean, I treat the things I work on very seriously, but I also know that they're toys um, and that, that, and toys are important, <laughs> um, but definitely, uh, yeah. And so the, the, I'm always, I, I try to I try to straddle, straddle that line. And I think we shouldn't diminish things just because they are toys or made for kids. I think it's like shaping the imagination of a child is really important. And there was a lot of, uh, actually during the Cold War, there was this this whole tension like about making um, uh, cartoons for kids. Uh, and, and the USSR was trying to actually produce uh, uh, content. Once again, a very French example, there is this. Yes. Uh, we had this kid magazine, Pif Gadget, which was uh, like financed by the French Communist Party. And that was basically an answer saying we are not going to be uh, colonized by uh, American popular culture and we're going to create our own popular culture that is going to be um, uh, a different one. So I think it's a it's not because it's a toy that it's not that it's not important. Well, and, and I'll and I'll give you my my, my favorite French example, which is <clears throat> um, Roland Barthes mythology is one of my favorite yeah. books in philosophy. He has a little essay in it uh, on toys. And the mythologies is is him interrogating the objects of everyday life. Uh, so he, he he talks about professional wrestling. He talks about why the Romans always have British accents. There's a lot of like fascinating little things yeah. in that book. But I love this essay about toys because he talks about how toys re reflect the culture and they're about indoctrination, the indoctrination of our children into a culture and about presenting our children with a smaller version of our world so that when they grow up, they will accept the realities of our world as natural because they have always been around sort of smaller versions of that. And Bart's actually praises, uh, or Bart, uh, Bart praises uh, wooden toys, things like blocks and, and of, of that, of that type, because they are without meaning necessarily. They allow the, mm. they allow the children to inscribe meaning upon them. And so, and I think about this a lot when it comes to game design, because I want, I want the games to be a really expressive sp space for players to take very different lessons from them and to be able to inscribe their own meaning onto those games. It reminds me a little bit, I mean, one of my, one of my favorite designs from the last 20 years uh, is, is, is the game that I'm sure some people here have heard of called Minecraft. Um, one thing I, I adore about the design of Minecraft is that the actual game loop is boring. I mean, you craft things, you go on a little adventure, you kill a dragon. So it's not that interesting, but Minecraft is so much more than that. And I, I used to love playing Minecraft back in the days before they put all that plot in there. Not that there's much. Um, because I would have friends who would get very bored of it. And they would say, oh, I've already crafted all of my items. I don't know what else to do. And I said, well, we can do anything. We can we can design games. We can we can have a play. We can we can tell all these stories. And I love that when you when you enter a, a, a new seed in Minecraft, uh, the world is is kind of it's just procedurally generated and over the course of playing you begin to mark it with 
the imprint of your own experience and then you start building this thing together um that is uh th that could just be absolutely anything um and then and of course you, anyone can probably see the line between that and a design like oath which is all about that kind of inscribing and and deepening Oh, I've got you muted. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 I was saying I'm going to be a bit cheeky. Now that we're talking about toys, we can talk about Root. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's not a toy, but still. Um, uh, just to say, so Root is a very different kind of game. We talk, mm -hmm. You talked a lot about Junk Company because the second edition is going to be released soon. Uh, we talked about Pax Pamir, obviously, and we talked a lot about historical design. And reflecting upon everything that you said before, what did you want to say when you made Root? What was your argument? What was your point? Mm -hmm. Well, Root, so here again, I want, to th I want to take you to the context of 2017. In 2017, um, a lot of the games in the mainstream hobby market were not terribly interactive. Uh, there was a real... Uh, I think a real desire. I think we, we were still very much in the hold of like the, the late UA games, Rosenberg games, which where we're all managing our own little farming plots. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But I really wanted something interactive. And in 2016, I uh, got a copy of Vast, the Crystal Caverns. And it blew my mind because it was so, it was fundamentally interactive. The drama of Vast was the interplay of these different positions. And I thought, this is what I want to see in games. I want to see more entanglement. I want to see more ecosystem, an ecosystem approach to game design. Uh, and then, you know, later, uh, Patrick hired me and he gave me a brief where he basically said, we have Vast. I, I want to make a, str a, a strategic asymmetric game. And I had been trying to, I've been thinking on similar notes, not in terms of asymmetry, but in terms of designing a very accessible war game engine. And I had been really inspired by um, by uh, Voco's work on the coin games. Andy and Abyss was a game I played a lot right when it came out, and uh, several of the others as well. I, uh, Distant Plane is fabulous. Um, and and, and Cuba Libre. Um, and so I started thinking, can I, like, one of the things I love about the coin system is how flexible that engine is. Is it possible to build a flexible engine that can present all of these different kind of political ecosystems? And uh, so when we went about building the, 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 the game, we were trying to go to that end. And, and, there were, and we got very lucky in, in some regards because, uh, you know, Kyle had been developing a setting for a game called Path, uh, an open world game with, with the animal characters, that we, when we put them onto an early draft of Root, um, we thought, oh, this is doing a very interesting thing for players because if, if the characters are adorable, players don't mind being mean to each other because it looks like a Saturday morning cartoon. Mm. And so we, we, we found that, you know, um, a lot of games when they have war themes, and I always, I, I, I feel bad for Eric because I always pick on Eric Lang here, but um, good naturedly, I promise. Uh, Blood Rage is a very um, kind game. It's got hate drafting, but it, it's, it's just not that mean. And so, but, it, but its theme is mean. And so to convince you it's mean, it's got this Adrian Smith art with a lot of crushed skulls yeah. and red and brawny people ripping each other apart. And that, that art is kind of saying like, okay, the game is this interactive. Let's have art that's like this interactive. So players kind of like can imagine themselves as existing in this more interactive game. Now, Root is the opposite. Root is way interactive over here. And the art is trying to convince players that it's back here. <laughs> So that it's pulling players into a spot where they can feel comfortable about the decisions that are making. And so I went into Root with this idea that I wanted players to play this very interactive game. And so a lot of the decisions about how Root is built were about making that accessible. And some of them have kind of been like lost in the, in, in the conversation, but I'll, I'll highlight a couple. Uh, the board in Root starts full. This is because I grew up playing a lot of Risk. And Risk, you know, in, in a game of Twilight Imperium, to, to go back to an early example, you don't uh, fight very often in the early rounds of the game, which means when players do start fighting, they get very salty at each other because they're like, oh, I was just building spaceships. I can hardly mm. blame them. The game, whoops, the, the game uh, was convincing them that this wasn't going to be a war game, and then they had to start fighting. And Risk got around that by saying, no, at the very first turn, the map is full. You have to fight. And so the entire game is going to be about fighting, and guess what? Players get over it. They understand the terms of the game because the game is being very upfront with them. So I thought when I worked on Root, well, of course the board has to start full. 
And then I knew that I needed one player to start the fighting first. And the player that I chose to do that is the Eerie. And the Eerie does its fighting through a programmed game, which means it gives the player playing the Eerie plausible deniability. She can say, oh, I'm not, I didn't mean to attack you, but I, I promised I would. And so it's this decree that's attacking you, not me. And then that gets the players used to the idea that they're going to start fighting each other. Um, and so there were a lot of these little decisions that happened. Now, when we worked on Root, uh, I was, of, of course, overwhelmed by its initial response on Kickstarter. Uh, I worked night and day, literally night and day on Root. I, I hope I never have to do that again. I, would, uh, I only at that time had one computer, which I just had at work. And so I would come home, do dinner, put the kids to bed, and then I would bike back to work so that I could work on Root at night. At, at the office because that was the only place where I had a computer. Um, and then, but when we finished Root, we had built something that everybody on the team was really happy with, uh, but we had no idea if people would like it. It was so mean and strange and there were really no other games like it. And when Gen Con came around and we saw the line in front of the booth, it was utterly overwhelming. And then that night, Walking, so Gen Con famously uh, has horrible spaces to play in. Like, especially at that time, there were no places to play. Uh, so people play on floors often, the, the wide convention hall floors, the wide hotel floors. And I remember walking back to the hotel that night and seeing people playing Root on the floors and just throwing dice and howling at each other and screaming and having such a good time. And I thought, oh, it, it does seem like people actually do want games that do entanglement that that are about ecosystems that put themselves in these very close positions of proximity and uh and seeing the response of that game and especially the games that have come out after that i think um you know borrow some ideas or try to advance it i think it's been delightful because it really shows that there's a real interest in games like that and i thought the thing that i loved about root is that and it's it's really I, I thought what you were saying was really interesting about the situation on the board, but it makes it very clear to the players that, well, aggression and violence is just the result of the system that they are in. It's like they are a faction, they are in that position. This is their objective, and this is their means of reaching those objectives. And the, the, there is the inevitability of uh, inevitab inevitability of violence, which which I think is a very very depressing <laughs> like, yes well in in a very cute setting and 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 just to to go back to the point about aesthetics and eric lang is that i think it's really interesting because blood rage is has a very as you say very aggressive aesthetics but i feel like the most brutal games that i ever had was pax Pamir, where i just have blocks and disc mm -hmm. and, and and root where i yeah. just have cute animals and i feel this is backstabbing and it's telling me so much more about systems and 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 situations more than anything else that i've played that was telling me, look, we're brutal. Yeah. Well, I always, I always told people that the uh, the meanest games that you could possibly play were eighteen XX games, anyway. Yeah. yeah like if you you've never you've never really hated someone until they've they've just stolen everything from you in an eighteen XX game. Um, I and I think that, uh, and I, I think this has to do with how unfortunately how often limited we are when we think about the interaction that games can provide, and and what 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 a game can do. And so when you get a game engine like 18xx that offers such amazing amounts of entanglement, then uh, the amount that players can do to each other is, is really off, off, off the, the charts. Now, Root is so violent because the game is a fundamentally Hobbesian framework. Um, and it's sort of a sandbox where I can put different, you know, I, I think about Root now as this kind of sandbox where I can say, what are some different um, geopolitical postures or also mm -hmm. internal political postures and can I abstract them into an asymmetrical like root faction? And then I just drop it in a, in a little mix. So you can kind of, especially now that there are 10 factions, we've really gotten to a point where you can recreate a lot of different situations in the abstract. And so it, it's a very fun design to work on because I get to read a lot of political theory and I get to think a lot about real world subjects without having to be uh, loyal to them entirely. Because I know that I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, one of them is going to be a mole with a helmet. It, uh, it, it's really interesting what you're. Distance. It's really interesting because a, a friend of mine was asking me why I liked Root so much, and I told them that because and it's a, it, he's a pretty big coin player, and I told him what I like about Root is that each of the faction or a political organization archetype, 
Um, and, and I felt that was it was really interesting, like the, the cats are the typical uh, counterinsurgent faction. They are in control and they are trying to just maintain the status quo. Uh, the, the, uh, the Woodland Alliance is a, is a typical insurrection, like you would find a popular insurrection, uh, like you would mm. see in Cuba in, in Cuba in the 50s. The lizards are typical terrorist organization sure. that, that are uh, like radical. And you could say that in a lot of way, the birds are like Russia today, like an empire that has fallen and has like strong autocratic, uh, yeah. but but still very clear uh, objectives and that are open to everyone. And it's like, and then you just have to work around the fact that they have those really clear objectives. And that's what I love about the game. They have really strong archetypes. And it's really interesting to hear you say, well, it's actually was a way for you to convey those archetypes in without having to be stay true to 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 history. Then my follow up question is about oath, um, mm-hmm. and it felt like oath was about building. Um, we in French would say a roman national, so a narrative around the history yeah. of your kingdom. And sure. I wanted to know was that the intent? What was the idea yeah. behind oath? Uh, that's a great question. I want to answer Sobi's question from the channel, if that's okay, because yeah. it relates to Root. Um, so uh, he, Sobi asked if, if the game could be um, considered as greenwashing, which is to say that I'm hiding um, uncomfortable politics by turning something into an alien or a lizard or something, as opposed to just talking about, um, I don't know, uh, ISIL or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and uh, the answer is no, because... Uh, what I tried to do when I was working on the game is to make the factions ideologically uh, independent. So, you know, you could you could read the Woodland Alliance as uh, a jihadist faction. You could read them as right-wing terrorists. Uh, like, you know, you could read them as the FARC. Uh, there are lots of different ways of reading them. I tried to find what's the commonality between a lot of groups that have this posture. So I tend to think about in root the governing identity of a faction is a posture, not an ideology. Um, and so, you know, like the, the lizards, um, I, I think what the, the lizards is operating in more of a religious space, but it's not linked to any mm. particular re- religion. Yeah. Um, so, uh, your question about oath and and national and le roman national. Yeah. Yeah. Le roman national. So, uh, oath, um, I wanted to make a game. So, uh, oath is a civilization game. Um, and you know, I think. I, I used to th- talk about it as if it was a hate letter to Civ games. It was, it was about all the things I didn't like about Civ games. And that's because Civ games just, um, when I think about history, when I when I think about the times in my life when I've had to do the real work of history, look at letters and try to like recreate an event, I was always, ha- it was always operating on a generational scale, on the family scale. And sometimes it would get to the national scale. But one of the things about the generational scale is that it means that the world does not change too quickly. If you look at a little Byzantine town in Asia Minor in 500, and you go again 300 years later to that same Byzantine town, it will be different, but it, they won't have rockets. And I think sometimes when you play Civ games, it it has this very fast um, progression where everything is always rushing to the present or what we imagine to be our near future. Now, in history, we call this a Whig historiography guy named Butterfield wrote a whole book about it. But it's this notion, this way of reading history that says, well, I live in the best of all possible worlds and all worlds, you know, I'm being a little Voltaire, Voltaire here. All worlds are leading up to this moment. Yeah, that that's is the thing. Our moment. Yeah. And so, so for Oath, I thought, okay, well, there is no, there is no moment. So that was thing one that had to be done. And that, that's one reason why the game changes so slowly. And here I was, I read a lot of Brodel and I was thinking about the long durée and ways of telling history that are political, but where politics is only one part of a broader experience. Um, But one thing I found when I was working on this is that I couldn't do world history because at the level of detail that I wanted, I had to stay within a single nation. And that that was just a very strange thing that happened. I I read this book. uh, I read Peter Frankopan's The, 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 um, The Silk Roads, which I used to go... Uh, bike around uh, South book. Minneapolis and would be yeah. listening to Frank, P- Peter Frankopan's The Silk Roads. And I'd go sail and then I would I'd be listening to it and then I'd bike home. This was like how I wiled away the the, 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 the pandemic in the year before. I would always be listening to that book. And I, I've, I've done it a couple times now. And I, because I, and I thought, I, oh, th- this is the book that I want to be the, the governing book of. I want to, I want to tell the story of commerce and cosmopolitan, uh, cosmopolitanism in world history. But what I realized was if I wanted to have a story, a a game that was telling a story that 
nobody, the work of world history is a much shallower pool. I mean, you get people like Herodotus, but most history that is written is not world history. It's the history of a people telling themselves their own origins and where they think they're going to go. And so if I wanted to do the work of history at the generational scale, it had to be the story of a single nation. And so that gave me the, the terms of the game, that I needed an in-class, the citizens and the chancellor, I needed an out-class, the exiles, and then the actual game state, the thing that evolves all of the world deck and all the cards on the board, that's the culture of mm -hmm. the game. And, you know, maybe there's a way in an expansion or another project to sort of put outsiders into the mix and to try to do the, that work of world history. But it made me start thinking that, like, comparative history is such a modern invention. And it just doesn't, isn't well suited to tell the kind of story that uh, Oath was going to tell. Okay, I have so many questions, but... Okay, so uh, <laughs> I keep, but, uh, I keep but, opening up. Keep oh, open. God, it's really, you're hurting my brain right now. Uh, because I want to talk about structures and superstructures and how they're sure. oh, within Oath. And I'm like, we cannot go there. We cannot yeah, there's, go there. There's that would be for, there that yeah. we can get into. Uh -huh. That would be for another discussion. But, and we're getting pretty close to an hour and a half. And I told you around an hour and a half. So We can go a little longer, but I'll, I'll trust you to moderate from here. Yeah, on. no, no, no. But even for my own sake, um, <laughs> I have to, I have to, I have to, to, to go probably into, into the last uh, part of this interview. So in a, in a, in a lighter uh, one, but I think, I don't know. I, I, I think I feel I just want to send you a long email with a list of questions that I want to answer for myself and then okay, sure. maybe eventually share it with the audience. Um, but yeah, before we go into the last part of the uh, of the uh, of the interview, just want a, a small shout out to the people who back that channel on Coffee that support me, and that's why you have the video in HD. So thank you for that, uh, and a massive thanks for people who reached out to uh, ask like ahead of time, send me some question for for Cole, uh, like the the person that that reached out for uh, specifically about the the, the Russian uh, implementation was a really interesting point, and uh, Stephen Ronkansas that asked the question about research that asked you in the beginning mm. about the levels of research yeah, yeah. and everything. Um, Steven Ranganzas, great young designer, so an amazing question. So thank you for, for, for that. Uh, so thank you everyone for this. And now we're going to go into the, into the last part of the interview that is a bit lighter, where I wanted to discuss about the industry, but also your future mm. projects. Um, and the thing that I first wanted to, to, to ask you is, so you you had Root, which was a massive success. Oath, that seemed like it did also extremely well. Yeah, and you talked well. about an expansion. You have John Company that is coming up. And you always have this tension between non-historical design and historical designs. Mm -hmm. Is you being extremely successful in, I would say, mainstream board games, uh, preventing you from doing future uh, historical designs of the future? Or do you have those in mind? And you think you, there is always going to be a balance between the two? I hope there will always be a balance. It requires a lot of work and discipline to juggle it. Um, but I want there to always, I want to always be working on a historical game and to always be working on a game that is not a historical game, as long as I'm able to. Um, I'm very, you know, one thing about the historical games is that they take me so long. I mean, John Company, I started, the first draft of John Company was started like a decade ago. And the second edition took two, two and a half years to, to finish. Um, the, the games that I do at Leader also take a long time, but it's closer to a year. And that is my full-time job. My day-to-day my, my, my -day is, is working at Leader and helping them both on the projects that I'm working on, but also helping manage all the other creative projects that, that we're doing. Uh, and, and that takes up like absolutely the, the majority of my time. But I don't mind that because the historical games, I want to go slow. I want to really take my time to read uh, and, and to immerse myself in, in a subject. And then th there are some times uh, where, you know, I will find uh, my, my schedule quite tight because I'm doing, you know, uh, I have to do pre-press on John Company and finish it while I'm also getting the ARCs prototypes ready. And those times are mostly the, the weeks when I have to work through the weekend or something. But, uh, but often they, they, there's almost no, no overlap. So I will keep those things in balance. I do have historical games I'm working on. Um, I am hoping to have some to show people uh, on a crowdfunding platform of some type uh, this summer. Um, and they're not games that I designed, but I'm helping with the development of, and I think they're really special and wonderful. And then I am working on, of course, the new edition of Infamous Traffic, which I have 
uh, the last three copies of it are sitting over there on my shelf. I had Amabel send me them, um, and I kept can, them. In can I make can, <laughs> can I make you a request? Yeah. <laughs> I would extend you anything for one of those copies. <laughs> <laughs> I need to use them for testing. I will. I, I will. I can make sure that we can find a copy. And actually, I, I will be. Um, so on the subject of infamous traffic, uh, John Company was such a difficult project. It was the hardest project I've ever worked on. It's harder than Oath, uh, in, in some ways. Um, and I did not want to think about infamous traffic at all while I was working on John Company. And so I kept them in shrink to stop myself from playing it some weekend and getting back into the mood. So I, I have yet to crack. The, the shrink, but I'm very close to being able to, to doing that and starting that process. I imagine that they will not be the upcoming crowdfunding campaign, but the one after that. Um, yeah, and I, uh, I, um, there are some other games that I'm working on too that I that are much too early to really talk about in any kind of way. But I'm doing a lot of reading. Okay, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to give a hint about what you were talking about uh, okay. without talking about it, oh boy. and I'm going to ask you. Looking at the hobby of uh, historical game design, uh, do you think that there are topics that are not necessarily enough explored that you would like to see more games on? The two games that we'll be publishing next, there are no games in existence that cover either of their subjects. That's the only hint I'll give about yeah, that. Yeah, no, but, uh, but, uh, and, uh, uh, but... But yes, I mean, the answer is yes. Like, I, um, I have no interest in making a game about the Pacific Theater. And partially that's because I know Mark has made the best game about the Pacific theater. Yeah, uh, I don't no need, need for a new game. I, yeah, I, don't, I don't need to make one. That, that's great. When, actually, whenever uh, there's always this funny thing about influence. And I think this is just, this is where I show my hand as a, as an ex academic. Uh, whenever someone says like, Oh, I'm working on th this topic. And I'm, uh, are you working on it too? I'm always like, Oh, thank God. I didn't want to do that project anyway. I'm so happy that it's being done. So if ever, whenever I find out someone's working on a project similar to mine, it makes me very excited. Because one, it validates my design instinct. And two, I don't have to do it anymore. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that like that is so liberating. Um, and so I'm, I'm always going to be picking subject, picking games on subjects that are not currently, uh, no one is attacking. But, but overall, so not talking about the specific things that are coming up uh, at Well Geek or that you're working on, do you, mm -hmm. in the games that you that you are not working on necessarily, but you're looking at history. Are there topics where you're feeling, oh, it would be so good if if a designer was taking that topic because I think there is a lot to explore here. So I am very excited about some of the games that are coming out at GMT right now. I think that they have a fabulous, like the next three years at GMT, Yeah, I think are going to be amazing. Um, so I'm very interested in non-breaking spaces, the Cross Bronx Expressway, which is just, completely shattering very compelling game uh the, and the a game... bit of auto promo here he was interviewed here so we'll add a link to the description to that interview. Yeah. Uh, yeah. he's a fascinating person to talk to about design yes. I've, I've, I've been lucky to talk to him quite a bit and uh and i'm, I'm very excited i mean it's, it's the sort of thing that when i first saw it i looked at it and i thought i wish i could have published this game this looks this is incredible this is exactly what i want to see um i'm very excited about the the prime minister game a game about 19th century victorian politics uh a, a subject that is central to john company that there could be a whole, a whole other game about i'm f so excited that there is a game coming out about the congress of vienna um i have yeah. a i designed a, a a little card game many years ago called metronix which is a um quasi trick taking game where you oscillate between periods of war and periods of peace so you're like playing one type of card game and then playing another type of card game and i really liked it it was cute and i never i never finished it or, or or pitched it anywhere but all i thought to myself was oh, i wish somebody would do a game about the congress of vienna because it's a great subject um so i'm very excited about all those all they're coming out um i had the good fortune to be on the board uh for the zenobia contest and mm. i will say that every single one of the finalists should be published yeah. They were all excellent. Um, yes. Many of them need, still need a lot of work, but the subjects, the approaches, some of the mechanisms, they were all so fresh and interesting. And, um, you know, we are currently right now, the board is deliberating if we're going to be able to run another contest soon and when we should run a contest because it was a lot of work for everyone. And I have been uh, doing my best to help everybody who was a finalist and anybody who was in the contest more widely get published. So that has been one of my one of my big preoccupations for the past five or six months has been trying to kind of head a little outcomes committee where we're just making sure those games find publishers somewhere. Are you going to publish one of them? I don't know. 
We'll see. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, and actually, you were talking about the lineup for GMT, and we talked about imperialism. And I was wondering, did you see that uh, game that was added to P500 a few months ago uh, called the British Way? Uh, that is a yes. Yes, it has the three micro games about four. Four. four my my yeah. God, what a project! Um, it is. Yeah. It is you. You. I think you need to play it because we're talking about not enough game talking about imperialism, and yeah. I think this is one such game uh, that is really talking about uh, about that in a very interesting way. And the fact that you have four in a row, four small scale coin games about um, uh, the the collapse of the um, of empire, is making such saying so it yeah. has so much things in there so many interesting points and yeah, you, you love it, it. Yeah. proper so when i was doing um uh so i you know i i often think about my history games as being the sequence about the british empire and i originally thought i would just do three but i think actually there might be five games in that sequence and, and this this is going to take me a decade to do the, this project and um it's occurred to me that you need that many titles. You need a multilateral pro, not a multilateral. You need like a, um, a montage approach to, to yeah. cap such, such a big uh, topic. Good. Uh, yeah, yeah, actually. And I have my editor in chief here that's saying, Fred, that's the moment where you ask Cole to, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you know, but, uh, a, a couple of years ago, we, uh, um, I had this uh, dumb idea of uh, having a consim game jam and, get people to make a, a war game in three days um and it just started from a, a provocation that i had with a discussion with uh with sean and joe um and we actually ended up doing it and and we and it was the the first concept game jam was uh, recycling a coin game and there was actually a lot of people looking at any game in the coin series and they could take the map take the wooden bits but then making a completely new game around That's it. Fun. And it was extremely fun. We had a lot of fun. David Thompson took part of it and he made a, a game with his kids using all bridges burning and putting it in a fantasy setting. And it was extremely, uh, oh, extremely it. Um, cool. And David's work is fabulous. I, yeah, I, David I, is insane. I'm a huge fan of Undaunted. I think it's one of the best squad it, level games. It is amazing. Play. It is amazing. I think it's, I, I yeah. It, but he's also a very annoying person because he, he delivers so many designs that you feel extremely bad about yourself. I, I am so he's, slow. I mean, yeah, here's, here's the, I mean, I do this professionally and I work on a lot of projects and I, I try to do a good job and I am just so, so I had a designer contact me to ask to do a co-design, a yeah. designer I really, really admire. And I wanted to say yes, but I had to just be honest. I was like, look, for a title like this, I'm going to be the slowest little wheel and yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to keep wanting to revise it right up to the end. I, you don't want to work with me on this project because I do just take, I mean, I, I, I take all, all the games I've worked on just take take much, much too long. But anyway, so concept game jam. Uh, David Thompson is annoying. We put that aside. It's uh, everyone yeah. knows that very annoying person, but also really awesome. Um, yeah, and and actually a game out, uh, out of uh, two games got put, got added to P five hundred afterwards. So in the oh, shadows, uh, in the shadows. Was, oh yes. Yeah, in, in the shadows was based on uh, a falling sky. So the map from falling sky, and they did something <laughs> about French resistance, which was extremely <laughs> took the funny. This is from Colonial Twilight. Yeah. <laughs> And actually, someone did someone in the setting a bit of uh, Asterix and Obelix, which I think was really fun, but I don't think that was publishable for IP reasons. And then um, Vijayanagara, who was originally based on the company. Oh, wow. Yeah, yes. and yeah. I'm also quite excited about that design. It's an, yeah, a very exciting game. So, But we're planning for an edition two, uh, and we don't know the topic yet. Would you we'll like see. to be part of the journey? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my, 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 my schedule is entirely determined by what month it is, because my goodness. And the thing is that I'm really bad at planning, so I won't be able to tell you what month it go. is before <laughs> we actually do it. Uh, but good. But maybe to close a bit um, uh, this interview and talking about game design and people getting into game design, would you have a few tips for aspiring game designers that want to get into there? Sure. Um, and knowing the topic of this channel, more on an angle of uh, historical game design. Yeah. So I, you know, what I usually tell folks for historical games, you should read. You should be thinking about a story and then ask yourself questions like, why do you think it would be a good game? Uh, and why hasn't anybody made it before? Or if they have, what did they do that you disagree with? I think I find as a designer to often, I like to be reactive. I like to hate a design and say, oh, I didn't like this game. So I'm going to design the anti version of this game. Um, and because that puts you right into the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and be critical of yourself. Uh, if, so, you know, the best thing you can do as a designer, as a creator of anything, is to develop your own taste and to then apply that your taste to your own work. 
and allow yourself to not be good at something. I often hate my, the games I work on uh, up until the very end. <laughs> um, and, and I think that, that that can be a really important thing. And then on the practical side, uh, games require a lot of iteration. And by iteration, I mean you are going... So we have this thing called the iterative loop, which is you come up with an idea and then you design it and then you test it and then you look at how the testing went and then you put in changes and then you implement your new idea and then you keep going the little loop. And as a, as a new designer, uh, know that you're going to be doing this a lot. You're never, your first version of your game is going to be horrible. I cannot stress that enough. So the best thing you can do is figure out how fast can you get back on the bicycle? Make that iterative loop as small, as small as possible. And that can mean teaching yourself some graphic design. That was the first thing I did as a designer. I, I learned how to use Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop and then eventually InDesign and figure out, you know, how you can set up your cards that if you do want to, you know, let's say you have a game with cards. If you want to change one of those cards, how quickly can you do it? Uh, in the product I'm working on right now, this iterative loop question is the only thing I think about. It occupies all my waking hours, so it, it doesn't go away. But do what you can to uh, get into the process of designing as fast as possible and to make it as frictionless as possible. And the very last point of advice is um, new, all, all new designers, even established designers, struggle to find testers. So the best thing you can do is cultivate a little group of people who want to help you learn how to make games. And oftentimes the best people for that are other people who are trying to make games. So you can f find someone else if you're working on a two-player game, find someone else who's working on a two-player game of similar character. And that could be a, of rules complexity or, or length. And work with them, play with them and offer to test their game and let them test your game and kind of build that relationship. I really love what you're saying here because that's often something that I see a part of the hobby going towards playing alone and playing solo and, and complaining about. And I think gaming is a lot about community and it also works for game design. And there is some like there is a lot of amazing Discord servers that you can join and start designing mm -hmm. with other new designer, young designers. And I think the current Discord server is a good example of that. Yep. And VSP came from there. Uh, the guys from Vijayanagara came from there. And it's like it's it's really it has a lot of value and I would say definitely if you're out there and you are interested in games and everything just make this effort of finding people around you and if there is no organized group then it means that you need to organize it go there and start organizing your own group uh, and 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 do that but that's that's really interesting and just maybe as a as a a, a couple of questions to conclude is any updates on arcs when, when can we sure. expect it what's so ARCs, I'll, well, I'll tell people what it is, just in case someone doesn't yeah. know. Um, we haven't officially announced it, really, uh, but it, it's coming. Um, ARCs is a design that is the... Um, every design I work on is always a re partially a reaction to the design that I did before. Oath is very much a reaction to Root, and ARCs is very much a reaction to Oath. Uh, Oath is all about continuity and, and the kind of gradual erosion of societies, and ARCs is all about in ending. It's all about the ends of things. Mm. And so uh, in a game of arcs, uh, the it's a science fiction game where you play um, either a one, two, or three episode arc, like a little saga. And um, at the end of every game, you make some narrative choices that then inform how the next game looks. And then you make some narrative choices that inform the final game. Um, but I love this design a, a lot uh, because it, it, it forces me to answer hard questions like, at the end of every game of arcs, you have victory points that you've earned in your in your game, and you have to spend them to do things. So if you built a giant fleet and you want to carry it over to the next game, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to spend all the political capital you built on. Or if you want to finish something or research technology, you spend those victory points. So it turns victory points to a real living currency. And as a design, I love it because it allows me to tell stories that are a little bit more specific than the kinds of stories that I could tell with Oath. Hmm. And it's a little bit more dramatic in its sensibility. So it has a lot to do with narrative and storytelling. If Oath had a lot to do with like history, uh, Arcs has a lot to do with narrative. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to work on. I've been working on it for about a year. Um, we will be uh, doing a crowdfunding campaign for it soon. Uh, we, do, we, don't, um, we haven't announced a, a date for it, but it'll be sometime in the next few months. Um, and then I'm hoping that it'll be done within a year or so. Um, but it's been a lot of a lot of fun to work on. It's a huge project. Um, the, the game is 
much lighter than oath. It's, it's, it's lighter than root, frankly. Um, I think that if, uh, I think it's probably as hard as learning how to play the eerie. If you were playing at your first game of root and you were going to learn the eerie and also had to learn the core systems of root, that's about the level of difficulty that arcs has, but there is so much, there's about an oath level amount of content in the box. So there's a lot of a lot of stuff to explore in the game, but it's it's pretty fast to just start playing. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. And and did Twilight Imperium influence you a lot in that design yeah. process? Was well, it in the I, back of your mind? I have I have three small children, and I can't play Twilight Imperium. In fact, I have it set up. I was play, I was yeah. playing with with my one of my children, um, but I, I can't sit down and play a ten hour or a twelve hour game. And so ARCs is my way of saying, hey, if you want to play, get a game that has the full narrative scope of Twilight Imperium, you can break it up into three small sessions, and each session is about an hour long. Or you could just sit down and play it in two or three hours, or you can break it up in different ways. But also, Twilight Imperium is a game I admire deeply, but it also bothers me because it has this great space opera, very grand space opera setting. There's a Latin on the box. It's got to be grand. Um, but uh, it mostly is a Civ game where... You build some technologies, you get ships, and then you go have a big tussle in, in the middle of the board. And then you figure out who's going to win. And when you read uh, the, the Incal or you watch Star Wars or you, or you watch, you know, any uh, it's the, sci the three body problem, the sci fi book of your choosing, Dune, those stories are so much bigger than just political contests. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when, one thing that, that, I, that I told uh, Kyle Farron, the, the artist, is one thing about Oath that bothers me is that the game oftentimes comes down to a political contest, which is fine. It's a game about politics. But history is a lot bigger than that. And so ARCs is my attempt to have a game where, like, maybe it isn't about who's going to control the galaxy. Maybe that isn't the thing that will determine the winner of the game. And so it has a much wide, so even though it's a shorter game and a much simpler game than Twilight Imperium, its narrative range is many fold wider than any title I've worked on. Now that's it. <sighs> gonna make me spend money, Cole. I'm gonna sorry. Spend, oh God. It's like you it'll, said, yeah. It's like- yeah, I mean, It'll be good. I'm working on it a lot. <laughs> it, it is the thing that I, I wake up thinking about it. I'm, oh. I'm really in the weeds right now. Uh, and the fact that you cited Lincoln, which I think is really interesting, because I think Lincoln is really interesting because it's a it's a big space opera without being a big space opera, and you feel like there is so many things happening, but the main political actors in Lincoln don't have Other full main. agency over what they're what is actually happening, and and one of the person that has a massive influence is actually pretty stupid. <laughs> and, and, well, and, and, and one thing too about the game, I, I saw this comment in the chat, and I'll just underline it: is Arx is built as a three and four player game only. Yeah. So it will it almost certainly won't have a two-player. It won't have a solo. I think it's possible to build a, a two-player and a solo for it, but I'm not going to build it in time for the for the for the campaign and for for the game's release. That may be something that we explore later. Um, and I also don't think the engine works very well at five or six players. And so my goal was: can I make a three-player game feel like a five-player game? And can I make a four-player game feel like a six to eight-player game? Because one mm -hmm. of my favorite games of Twilight Imperium was a game I played with eight people. Who all knew the game very well, and we played it quite quickly. Uh, and it just the world felt so teeming. And so as I'm playing Arcs, I'm thinking, is this game? Are there things that I can do to make the three and four player game feel like a big table? Because it's so much easier to gather that number of folks together. And one big difference is when you play a game of Arcs. If you, when you play an Arc, uh, you can't swap players b between the games. I, I mean, I guess you could, but unlike oath your player position is transposing directly into the next game um there's also no like limit your, your set isn't going to spoil um you can be played many 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 times uh, w w without running out of content and to conclude uh this amazing discussion thanks again for taking the time uh would you have a few uh recommendations of games or designers that recently uh, got your attention and that uh, you would like to um explain Put some light on or oh sure sure um let me let me think here oh i've been so in a uh what have i been playing recently that has been really exciting i have been playing okay so i'm gonna do i'll do a a, a real scatter shot of things um uh a book i'm reading i'm reading mary beard's spqr for the second time it's great 
I've also been reading. Here we go. This someone mentioned how um, we were talking about Hobbes, and they thought this is a funny chat. This is the book that I've been obsessing about lately. This is Thomas Pynchon's Mason Dixon. I have it sitting Oof. next to my table because uh, I was in. I have a book club where we read Pynchon novels, and this is the second to last Pynchon novel that the book club has done. So we've been we've been doing almost all of them. Or I guess we, we haven't done Crying a Lot, but Crying a Lot is short. doesn't count. Um, and so I've been reading those books and really enjoying them. Uh, I have been playing Undaunted, which is great. And uh, I've been really enjoying North Africa. Uh, last summer, I played through a lot of the Normandy scenarios with one of the yeah. staff uh, developers at Leader Games. And I've been meaning to play North Africa, and I've been playing it with, with my partner and having a really good time with it. Um, the game that I'm thinking about a lot lately has been Nicaea by Annabelle Holland, uh, which is a really interesting tableau builder, which also has fundamentally different ways of thinking about history and subject from how I think about history and subject. Yeah. Uh, just a very different storytelling approach. And I, I, I find it kind of exciting and, and curious. Um, and then uh, let me think about what I'm, I'm going to look over at my shelf and see if there's anything else that is jumping out at me that I feel like I must bring up. Oh, here, here's a strange recommendation. I just played an auction game uh, called Square on Sale, which is a Japanese auction game that is like Othello plus the estates. And it is utterly bewitching. It's so oh, strange. Yeah. Uh, and so that, that's that's what I've been that's what I've been playing. Okay, but that's yeah, great recommendations, yeah. good stuff to explore. Uh, I would like to thank you again for um... oh, your game. Sorry, I, and I, I almost forgot. <laughs> um, one of the best short GMT games that has come out. I mean, there aren't many short GMT games. That sounds like faint praise. It's very good. There are two short I don't know GMT how much, games. I don't know how much <laughs> log rolling I'm allowed to do, but everyone should get uh, Red Flag because it's fabulous. Yeah, obviously, obviously, there are not that many copies left. I would say that. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, yeah, get there fast. Um, great, but it was once again, it was awesome having you. It was a great discussion. Uh, sorry, it took a bit longer than what I originally That's expected. No and if you are still watching this at this point in the video, uh, and if you like what I do, remember to like, add some comments, share the content around you, subscribe, and all those things. Uh, and yeah, thanks everyone for being here tonight. It was awesome in the chat. There was a lot of really interesting discussions in parallel. Um, and I feel like we have a lot of things to talk about again. <laughs> maybe yeah. I will try to invite you again on the show, maybe to play a game and chat on some, about yeah, something that... on the side that could be also pretty nice. That but sounds for, great. But for now, I would say good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks again. And uh, see you next week uh, for the viewers. Bye-bye. All right. Take care.